Mastery of drawing is about freedom. A mother went to Rembrandt to ask him to take on her son as a student. And Rembrandt said, show me his drawings and I'll tell you whether he can become a painter. Drawing is the essence of painting. It's also the essence of sculpture and architecture. This video is an introduction to a set of videos I'm going to try to do in which I am above all going to talk about how to learn to draw, but by the same token about what the essence of drawing is. The word drawing means many things. I am going to be talking about what I claim is drawing in the highest sense. What might be called the lesser, or if you prefer, the partial kinds of drawing are things that are efficacious in different ways for different purposes. But the final purpose of drawing, ultimately, as it relates to painting in particular, is the conception of compositions in the context of true painting. The ideals that motivate people to get involved in this kind of drawing and the effort to master it are things which no longer have any worldly importance. And therefore, <laughs> I, I feel a little bit funny about it because, I, you know, in, in a sense, I feel like I'm leading people down a, 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 a path to nowhere in a certain sense. So, unless you're someone who is... Um, willing to, uh, as I put it, live the true artistic adventure of our time and to suffer a lot of loneliness and frustration, then uh, don't watch this video. I should say that I managed to earn a living as a painter, but that occurred at a very modest level outside of any kind of normal gallery and even though I did manage to cobble together a couple of shows for myself in New York where I managed to make back the money I'd spent living and working for the previous year and paying for the show that was at a time when living was much easier and the rest of my career occurred in a very small town in France where people still like to buy pretty paintings for a modest price. In 2008, thanks to my friend Matt Friedman, who recently died, we had a show together in New York and Brooklyn. We had a movement, an art movement together. Uh, we were Klumpists. Here we are at the Klumpism show two days before the opening. Matt Friedman and Paul Rhodes. Let's walk inside. I wouldn't say I put green triangles on my paintings, Here. but uh, Matt was there. certainly a contemporary sculptor, and some of the works were collaborative, like this painting of Judith and Holofernes, where the blue blood was extended sculpturally onto a puddle on the floor. I'll link the video. In any case, that experience showed me that any hopes I still clung to for there being an evolution in the art world were vain, and I've since completely given up on them and reconciled myself to a very private experience with art, which has been alleviated through my contacts via YouTube. So, an artistic life, a life in art, 
is not impossible and perhaps bit by bit, in part thanks to the internet, a new but true artistic bohemia can be built up where the dynamics of human interaction can fertilize the artistic life so that maybe the Western artistic tradition, this magnificent flame, which we've inherited in the form of a torch with a tiny little flickering flame about to go out, we, we could carry it forward and nurture it and maybe something could happen. Who am I to be talking about this? I am the son of an artist. I grew up in the artistic bohemia of the time in New York, or what was left of it. I wanted to be a painter from right away. I wanted to be like my father, but I knew a lot of painters who I admired tremendously, just as much as I admired the paintings of my father, particularly Herbie Katzman and Gandy Brody and Bob Darista. But when I was growing up in the 60s, contemporary art was coming in with a bang. I experienced how it drove these artists out of the New York art world. These artists who had been important in the late 40s and 50s. You could look it up. And who today are completely erased. I always had a, an inspiration that was more traditional, though I wouldn't have put that word on it at the time, because I was open to modern painting as much as older painting. I, as a child, I was more in tune with modern painting. I, you know, artists like Rembrandt, I didn't get when I was a kid. I, I started getting Monet and some painters like that early on. It wasn't until I was uh, in my mid-teens that I discovered Watteau, and through Watteau, really got into all of you know the the old masters and so on. So I felt like there was a, an artistic world that was going on. Though I watched these painters being pushed out of New York with the emergence of contemporary art. And I experienced that as a kid, and it seems strange to me, and I always felt that it was going to calm down. <laughs> you know, some sense would come back. And I, I carried that belief for a very long time. That belief was augmented in 1991 when there was a great crash in contemporary art prices. But uh, then I watched how there were all kinds of governmental efforts to prop up contemporary art, and I, I watched the shenanigans, what went on. And I finally realized, particularly after that experience I've just mentioned with the Klumpism show, that uh, it just was never going to happen. Let's go into the back room. It's still life. In dialogue, as we say in the art business, with the story of Samson and Delilah, or the hairless Jew. Note the repetition of the platonic solids. In any case, I had the great good fortune when I was 14 to go to a school where a man named Aaron Curzon was uh, the art teacher. Aaron was uh, born in 1920. He's still alive. He's 100 years old. He lives in Connecticut. He had had a, a training which many artists of the time had had, both with people who had studied in Paris. Uh, I, Cameron Booth, I know he studied with in, in the Midwest. He grew up in Minneapolis. And I think Cameron Booth did some studying in Paris. In any case, Cameron Booth had that Parisian academic uh, thing going. And so Aaron got that. Later in New York, he studied with Vaslav Vitlichel, and other students of Hans Hoffman, and he also had some contacts with Hans Hoffman, as practically everybody did back then. Hans Hoffman had studied with important artists all over Europe, but Matisse especially, and Hans Hoffman was the teacher of all the abstract expressionists, which was the movement that took over in the early 60s 
and banished representation from painting. But Hans Hoffmann's teaching contained something very important. After I left high school, I went to four different art schools. The first one was Hans Hoffmann's school where his students were still teaching. I was told that I was the youngest student ever admitted to that school. Even though Hans Hoffmann was so important in launching abstract painting in America, the pillar of his teaching was figure drawing. These studies may not impress you very much, but they are two-figure, ten-second studies. These particular studies were praised by Mercedes Matter, who was the head of the school at the time, as the best drawings of the semester. So whatever it was worth, I managed to absorb that education. Hoffman taught what was absolutely at the essence of figure drawing and drawing in general. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm also going to talk about Aaron's teaching because he combined the more academic approach with the Hoffman teaching. And I'm going to try to explain what that was about and also show the special exercises that Aaron developed a way of teaching, which I got deeply into because after high school, I eventually ended up living with him and his wife for about 10 years, and I did a lot of student teaching with him. In New York, at his high school drawing class, models would come who worked all over the city at all the art schools and universities and so on. And they were always saying how Aaron's students were the best in the city. So his drawing class was really something very special. Over the years with Aaron, I helped him with his holographic work, just as I had and continued to help my father with his ball machines. And I also got Aaron to paint a portrait of me because I loved his portraits and he did so few of them. And that was a tremendous learning experience for me also. Another aspect of Aaron Curzon is that he was the first and really the most important disciple of Marcel Duchamp, who he met and knew in the 1930s through the woman who became his wife, who was a close friend of Duchamp. Of course, Duchamp was known but it so happens that Aaron was an important influence on the neo dadists particularly Rauschenberg. It was through Aaron, for instance, that Rauschenberg learned a great deal about Duchamp. I'm mentioning these things to show that even though I'm such a promoter of tradition and that sort of thing, I was always in the milieu of contemporary art and all the most profound ideas that led up to contemporary art and fed it. And I even participated in it. Even when I was a, a little kid, I went to a school that was right off Madison Avenue near the Metropolitan Museum. And after school, I'd go to the Met or else I'd wander up and down Madison Avenue to visit the galleries. This was in the early and mid-60s when contemporary art was emerging and all the galleries were on Madison Avenue. I'm not going to even begin to recount the history of my drawing education, which lasted right up into my 50s, if you like, before I felt like I'd finally gotten on top of it. But I just wanted to point a few of these things out to establish a little bit my bona fides. None of it proves anything, of course. And of course, I did a lot of copying. I won't show tons of copies. Just these photos I just came across of copying Fragonard in the Met. Polaroid some museum goer took and gave to me. However, I am going to tell a story about 
one of my experiences in Boston when I went to the Boston Museum School with a teacher named Clarence Washington. Clarence Washington was a black guy who was almost always drunk. And very few people went to his classes. We'd be in there, one, two, or three of us. And next door, there'd be a class full of 60 people. <laughs> anyway, I learned a lot from Clarence. He was a, a Picasso worshiper, the way some people still are, and the way everybody was at mid-century. Here's a painting by Aaron from 1947, and here's a picture of Herbie that I just found on the internet with one of his paintings, which looks exactly like a lot of Aaron's paintings. Here's a Hans Hoffman I found, same kind of thing. I learned about this stylistic unity of the mid-century American painters when I was visiting Paul Reska one time at his studio. Paul was a friend of Aaron's and a Hoffman student. We were talking about the influence of Picasso, and he explained to me, you know, everybody was painting like that, and he pulled out this old painting. I couldn't believe it. It was exactly like one of Aaron's or exactly like that painting of Herbie's. American artists at that time, they, they were all doing this Picasso thing, but they were experimenting with a lot of stuff going in all different kinds of directions. If you check out, for instance, Paul Reska's work, you, you can wonder where it comes from, but you can see in the detail of this painting here how he really understands drawing. That's a rather beautiful figure, very, very simply expressed. The point is that these older artists, even though they got into abstraction and different kinds of things, they all had this terrific education, particularly in figure drawing. And Clarence was one of these guys. I can't find any of his work. He seems to have dropped off the surface of the world. There's nothing about him on the internet. Anyway, I guess it was in 76, 77, I was studying with him. Sometimes we didn't have models, and then he would pose for us, or we'd pose for each other. Here are some drawings I made of him. I was really struggling. <laughs> I felt like you know, I couldn't do anything. I, I was no longer under Aaron's wing in high school. And when you leave a very strong teacher like that, you then slip off, and it takes a lot of struggle to get back to the level that you had when you were supported that way. So I regarded my own work as almost hopeless. But one day, Clarence put out the work of different students, and he started praising my drawings in this uh, tremendous way and ended up comparing my drawings to Daumier. Today, such a remark would mean nothing <laughs> to most people, I guess. But even in the 70s, it carried great weight. Daumier was still considered as one of the great high points and most inspiring artists of modernism, and particularly as a draftsman. But at the time, I was offended by this. It seemed to me either stupid or irresponsible. I'll tell one more story about Clarence. Once my father came to visit me in Boston, and he met Clarence, and Clarence said to him, Make sure that Paul stands behind every line he draws. My poor father didn't know what to say. He smiled and nodded and said, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So Clarence, in spite of his eccentricity, Clarence was really a remarkable and passionate teacher. He did a lot of surprising things. I'll give one example. One day, he watched me draw for a while, and then he said, move up much closer to the model. <laughs> what a revelation. Right away, I saw what he wanted to show me, which was that I was looking in much too abstract a way. Once I was close enough and I, I you know, I, I saw the flesh and the stuff and there it was. And the, the, it, it, it made an instant change in how I approached, how I was drawing. I'd gotten into something that was, that was very bad and it really put me right back on track. So he, he was inspired. And those kinds of experiences 
make you realize how many aspects there are to drawing. Anyway, with respect to this Daumier business. If I had been able to accept that compliment in the right spirit, if I had been able to understand what Clarence was communicating to me, it would have greatly accelerated my development. It was a strange situation. In the 70s, it was the total triumph of contemporary art. Drawing, the whole, you know, the old masters, all that was out. And I was regularly labeled a fascist for being interested in learning to draw and that sort of thing. I'm not saying poor me. I'm actually proud of that, but I don't think I should get any medals for it either. I, mean, I wanted what I wanted, and I was in the world that I was in, and that was what was going down. That's It's how it had to happen. So I'm mentioning that simply to describe the situation. The description of the situation is valuable with respect to the problem of what drawing is and what it is to learn to draw. There was not, in a sense, an avenue to move forward. It, it, it seemed to everybody like going backwards and going to, towards nowhere. So to conceive of drawing at that time as something positive, something to go towards, something to build with, was not a clear-cut thing to do. And I had such an exalted idea of drawing. And I was, to a certain extent, and Aaron warned me about this, involved with how things looked, the look of these different artists, that I had difficulty getting involved with what it actually was. In other words, coming to grips with the essence. And what Clarence was indicating to me was that I was getting a hold of a certain essence. You can see in this drawing, for instance, that the character of the figure, the character of the pose is powerfully expressed. The forms are powerfully and simply expressed. Expressing something simply is part of expressing it powerfully and part of expressing it beautifully. I don't think this particular drawing is one of the ones that uh, Clarence was comparing to Daumier. But I've got so many drawings out there, I'm not going to spend hours pawing through them. It doesn't really matter. The point about Daumier's drawing is that it's all about powerful expression with a strong sense of the decorative. People who follow my channel will know what I'm talking about. But Daumier was very important to, to modernism in that sense. And if I had known how to listen to Clarence Washington in the mid-70s, it would have sped me along the road. He was telling me that I was getting a hold of something essential at a time when I was too worried about non-essentials. We shouldn't worry about drawing like Michelangelo or drawing like Raphael or drawing like this one or drawing like that one. We should worry about getting to the essence of the problem of drawing and that is going to open painting up for us as well as sculpture and architecture. And when we have a hold of that, we will be holding the same thing that Michelangelo and Raphael and Leonardo had their hands on. Will we grasp it as powerfully? Maybe, maybe not. That's not the point. The point is you get a hold of that tool and then you can enter that world and you can play that game.